if I can get all straightened out here for you. I want to really uh, try to intentionally sort of slow myself down tonight. Amen. And what I want to do is I want to teach you some scriptures tonight out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <coughs> When God uh, came to earth, He took a body. It's called the incarnation, the in-flesh coming of God, Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, Amen. and we beheld His glory. Amen. So there, is a, there was a body on the earth. Jesus took a body, Hebrews 10 says, and uh, that body was a perfect body. It was a human body. He was the God-man. And in that life that you and I couldn't live, a life of perfect obedience, He was taken to the cross and crucified as a perfect sacrifice for us so that you and I could have a perfect salvation. Amen. God took a body. Now eventually, uh, after the resurrection, time of uh, ministry for 40 days following the resurrection, there was an ascension, and Jesus in His body ascended to heaven. You right. men of Galilee, why look you up into heaven? This same Jesus shall come in like manner as ye have seen Him go. So, He's coming back in a body. So the body of Jesus, born of a virgin, crucified on a cross, put in a grave, resurrected bodily, ascended back to heaven, but before He went to heaven, He made sure that He left a body to represent Him on the earth. He left a body. It's a physical body. It has a spiritual nature to it. And that body is the church. Now when I say the church, I, I use that in an institutional generic sense in the fact that it could represent any local New Testament church. But it does represent a local church. And so tonight what I want to do is I, I want to try to help us as I help myself again to remind what I know the Bible teaches. I want to help you understand what this concept of the body of Christ is. Now, it is uh, only referred to 32 times in the New Testament, in the Bible. In the New Testament there are 7,957 references and only 32 of those talk about the body of Christ. Uh, you find the listings underneath there. Romans has two of those references. 1 Corinthians where we ask you to turn has 18. Ephesians has 8. Colossians has 4. There are no other places in the Bible. Now what's happened in theological schools and in those who are studying the Bible, they usually follow what is called the law of inversion. You probably don't know what that is, but I'll tell you what it is. Quite often, the least that is said about something, the more we want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Sort of like the thorn in the flesh. What does that mean? Well, there's not much. There's only one chapter that contains that. And but my goodness, I saw the other day there were hundreds of ideas about what the thorn in the flesh was. It's that temptation to somehow capture something that is not spoken of broadly and uh, our curiosity sort of gets uh, the best of us. Let's read a few verses together, okay? Here's what I want you to do. You have a King James Bible in your hand or in your phone or, well, yes, you can turn your phone off. Okay, here we go. Uh, I, I want us to read it. When we come to the word body, 
I want you to say that out loud, okay? Because I'm going to pause and I'll let you say the word body. And that's going to sort of emphasize for us kind of what we want to see as we read through 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. Are you ready? Say amen. amen. All right, here we go. We're reading out loud and you're going to fill in the blank with the word body. Verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being member, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Or if the ear shall say, Because I am not of the eye, I am not of the body. Is it not therefore of the body? If the whole were an eye, that's kind of a weird thought, wouldn't it be to kind of walk around with this huge eyeball? I mean, you know. If, okay, let's, excuse me for my distraction there. Verse 17 again. Here we go. Ready? If the whole body. were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the? Body. But now are they many members, yet but one? Body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the? Body. Which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the? which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the together, having given more abundant honor to that part which, which lacked, that there should be no schism in the but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Verse, final verse now. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So let's talk about this passage tonight. And uh, you'll pray for me as I move along in this. First of all, I want to talk about the fact that there is a misunderstanding of the body of Christ. And it falls under these headings. Number one, many people misunderstand the nature of the body of Christ. It is believed by many that all believers are in the body of Christ. If you hear uh, radio preachers and TV preachers and seminary professors talk about the body of Christ, they generally are using that as a code for a universal, invisible church called the body of Christ. That's what they mean. That's what they're talking about when they talk about the body of Christ. You hear people talk about that and, and they just sort of you throw it out there without any kind of connection to what the context is. Let me give you a, an example of that. Lewis Schaefer was the founding president of Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, he wrote a systematic theology. And in that systematic theology, he had a section in there on ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. Listen there were 263 pages of notes. Only 10 of them dealt with what he called the gathered church or the local church. Now, can you imagine? Out of all the study about what a church is, 
He wrote 253 pages on a universal church, which we've already seen, would have very few references, and then wrote only 10 pages on, on what he uh, called the, the local church. Let's read what he says here. And, and you immediately find out where his position is. He says, The true church is not divided, nor could it be, yet the visible church is broken and shattered uh, is a broken and shattered attempt at the manifestation of the scriptural idea. The visible church as such is charged with no mission? That, that's my question mark. Really? The commission to evangelize the world is personal and not corporate. I, I'm amazed that guys who are so intelligent and so uh, biblically minded would have such a statement as that. I mean, I can just, if I had a gun right here, I could shoot target practice with several things that are said about it. I, I, don't, even, I don't even think I need to. Church has no mission. That sounds like the Great Commission, doesn't it? I mean, was that given to the church or individuals? Well, we know it was the church. Well, uh, I, if, if Lewis Schaefer was the only one doing this kind of stuff, then I'd pass it off as a, just an unusual coincidence. But that's not true. Charles Ryrie has a good study Bible. Uh, I say good, and it's good as any man's study notes in it. But look what Charles Ryrie says about it. He says, The universal church to which every true believer belongs, regardless of local church affiliation. Huh. It is a spiritual organism entered by means of the baptism of the Spirit. Quoting a verse I'll talk about in just a moment. Christ is the risen head of the church and its members are subject to Him. He throws some verses in there to believe that. Local churches should be miniatures of the body of Christ, though it is possible to have unbelievers in local churches who are not therefore members of the body of Christ. I can't keep up. Are you kidding? Uh, just reread it again, if you will. Maybe you can make better sense out of it. Now, it shouldn't be surprising to us that Protestants have a Protestant view of the church. And a lot of that is hangover beliefs of their Catholic forefathers that believe something about the church that is not scriptural. If you're going to be a Protestant, you're going to hold a Protestant view, and the Protestant view is that everybody that's saved is a member of the body of Christ. And yet right in this passage you read it, it was the last verse that we read together. Paul said to the church at Corinth, those who had been baptized, who had been one to Christ in Acts 18 and were baptized and were gathered together and in some organizational fashion which the Bible doesn't identify became a church and writes to them in 1 Corinthians and says, I'm writing this to the church of God which is at Corinth. He says to them, but now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Amen. That local church was the body of Christ. Right. Now some people say, well, Brother Jerry, what do you think that means? Well, it isn't what I think the Bible says. It isn't what you think about the, what the Bible says. What really matters is, what did God mean and how would those original Christians have received that to mean to them? Well, He said to them, you're the body of Christ. What would they have thought? <laughs> We're the body of Christ. He didn't say, you're part of the body of Christ. You're a miniature of the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. The local church at Corinth 
was the body of Christ. I think there's a much better term to use, which is not used, which could be used and clarified, and, and I would just be so happy. I know you wanted me to be happy, right? I know that's sort of in one of your higher goals of life. Make Brother Jerry happy. Well, here's how to make Brother Jerry happy. Drop this vague universal church concept of the body of Christ and call believers in Christ as members of the family of God. People who are saved are in the family of God. They're born again into the family of God. Aren't you glad you're a part of the family of God? But far from that being the same as being a member of one of the Lord's churches, it's, uh, it's quite different. Here's something was stated on uh, one, of the, one church that I was researching. Uh, this is on their website. Each individual congregation is autonomous. That means self-governing. Yet part of a larger body of Christ with many expressions in many locations. Believers achieve oneness in Christ that transcends all human limitations, including the differences that exist between denominations. You know what that is? That's a bunch of babble. That's a cover-up for why there's so many different doctrinal positions in churches that are supposed to be joined together in a body of Christ. It's... You know, fake news isn't just a political thing around. I mean, there's a lot of fake theological news that's going on. And uh, I wonder how could God be pleased with the kind of things that's going on in all these various denominations when the Bible says He's not the author of confusion. He's a God of order. Uh, hold your place here in 12. And uh, let me just go back to chapter 4 for just a minute. And look at verse 17. You might want to mark this last phrase. Paul writing to the same church now says this, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ. Notice the last phrase as I teach everywhere in every church. You understand what that means? There was consistency by the Apostle Paul in what he taught in every church. Look at chapter 7 in verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, Notice his last phrase now. And so ordain I in all churches. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that you and I should have and have to have a central theological base upon which we agree as a church and other scriptural churches will join you in that common belief. Now, we may not believe everything. They may not believe in white walls in churches. I don't know. They may believe in green walls. They may not believe in, I don't know what color this is, so I'm going to go on. <laughs> gray, gray pews. They may, they may uh, believe in chairs. But I'm talking about the core values, the core principles, the core doctrines. There has to be agreement. It's a cover-up to say, well, that's what they believe. Let's just let them believe. We're all in the same body. If that were the case, the body would be very diseased, very confused, and very inept. So there's a, there's a misunderstanding about the nature. The nature of the body of Christ is a local church. Now here's another thing there's a misunderstanding about, and that is many misunderstand the, the head of the body of Christ. The headship of Christ is mentioned in Ephesians 1, chapter 4, chapter 5, where it says that Christ is the head of the church. Usually it is in a, it is in a generic or institutional sense where it says that He is the head of the church. But it was all written like, in Ephes, like Ephesians to the 
church at Ephesus. So it's talking to a local church. Now hang in here with me because I want to show you a diagram that may help you. Many misunderstand the headship of the body of Christ like this, like Christ is the anatomical head and that people make up a body and it's the brain, the mind, the head that, that kind of calls out all of the functions of the body. And, and you find this erroneous idea, I shouldn't have exposed my point already, but you, you, you find this erroneous idea all the time with guys who say, you know, it's, it's, it's Christ who is the head of our church and as a result of that, we work off of His impulses and we, we do His will and, and because He's our head. And they're talking about an anatomical brain. What they haven't thought about is this. In an anatomical head, it survives as it's connected to the anatomical body. And if it's separated from the body, it ceases to exist. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ is, is not dependent on us for His life. We're, he's not connected to us in a way to where if it's not for us, we, He just is not going to make it. Now don't get me wrong. We are brought into union with Christ when we're born again. You understand that? We, we came into the world being in Adam, but when we got born again, we were placed in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Some of those verses like that tell us that there is a genuine union that we have with him. But instead of thinking about Jesus being the head, the anatomical head, what we need to realize is that the headship of Christ over the church is not an anatomical but an authoritative head. He is the head, authority over the church. And that's altogether different. I mean, that's, but it's very understandable. Uh, when Henry Ford was alive, he was the head of the Ford Corporation. When uh, Conrad Hilton was alive, he was the head of the, the Hilton Hotel Corporation. When Sam Walden was alive, he was the head of uh, Walmart. So we've got a different concept that's misunderstood quite often. And why is this so important? Because this, this anatomical head is where people tie it to a universal, invisible, all believers in it because they think Christ cannot be the head over many bodies. But He can be the head over many bodies if He's an authoritative head. He's an authoritative head. And He doesn't... He's not dependent upon us for His life. We are dependent upon Him for our life. Amen. He is our head. And that's why He can be the head of Victory Baptist Church here in Kingfisher. That's why He can be the head of the church that I'm a member of in Fort Worth, Texas. And He can be a member, He can be the, the head over all true, independent, fundamental, King James, temperamental Baptist churches. Amen. He can be a head over them. And he can function as the authority. Now, I believe in a pastor-led church. I believe that's the pattern of the Bible. I don't think God leaves the leadership of the church to sort of a vagueness and a fog in a church. I believe that the man God puts uh, to lead the church is the pastor. But ladies and gentlemen, he's not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the authority and your pastor serves under his authority. And he has authority indeed. He's God's man in this place. But he has that authority under Christ. And you have your responsibility as God's people there. Well, I hope that that may have helped you. It sure helped me to understand the difference there because quite often I was thinking the other way. And if you read it, you'll read a lot of people who, who think the other way. And it conforms to their... Protestant, one body, all believers in it view, but it doesn't conform to the teaching that there were many scriptural churches. And, and by the way, if you remember, when Revelation was written, there were seven churches, weren't there? And Christ was right there presiding over all of them. 
See, he presided over all the churches. He was the head of the church. He was the head of the church at Ephesus, Pergamos, Smyrna, all the way through that whole deal. He was that over. And uh, I think that that is really a revelation for some of us to understand how he does that. He's a sovereign Lord over all of his churches. Amen to that. Man. There, there's also a misunderstanding. We're in the misunderstanding heading, kind of the, kind of the uh, third heading here. The misunderstanding about how you get in the body of Christ. How, the entrance into the body of Christ. Many teach, again, excuse me, let me go back. Many teach that all believers bapt, are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Oh, my goodness. You can't hear a Bible teacher on radio. You can't hear one on television. You can't read their books without some 1 Corinthians 12, 13 reference that, why am I? That's just so apparent. It has to be that way that that's the way it is. Now, remember, this passage doesn't mean what it means to you. It means what it meant when Paul was inspired by God to give it. And it meant what the Corinthians knew that meant to them in that moment. We get our understanding from God who gave it and from those who first received it as a congregation. Now let's read this verse together again. Not out loud necessarily, but let me just go through this about how you get into this body of Christ. Now if we believe, I'll let you de determine if that's what you believe. But if we believe that the body of Christ is a local church, then we believe that this verse is about how you get into a local church. Let's see if that works, okay? It starts off like this. It says in verse 13, For by one Spirit... Now that's a capital S. You don't have to do like Arthur Pink does and make that a little S. You don't have to. Arthur Pink was a local church guy... And he believed you interpret this verse by saying that it's a, the spirit of man, his, his idea, his attitude. And he wasn't, he's not an, uh, he wasn't a crazy guy. He was okay. He, 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 was, he, was, he was quite a theologian. But you don't have to do that. I believe that the Holy Spirit is the one that brings us to salvation. Amen. Nobody ought to be baptized unless they're born again. It's by one Spirit. There's not 15 spirits. There's not 25 spirits. There's just one Spirit by, by one Spirit. And uh, you see, salvation is a work of God. It started with Him. It, it's never going to end because He's going to make sure He's going to maintain what He started. Aren't you glad you're born again? Amen. That's the work of God. And I don't really separate... You know, some people try to separate about when regeneration happens. I believe that the Bible says that we believe and are born again. Now, some guys believe you're born again to believe. But in the Bible, it's pretty consistent that you, you hear the gospel, you believe that, and you're born again. And all of that's the work of God anyway. So don't quibble over which way it happens or when it happens. But, you know, it's like God calls you. Did you hear Him? Yeah. Did you obey him? Yeah, praise God. Probably got saved that night. You know, we're, we're just so goofy. About that. Goofy is a Greek word for goofy. Okay, you, I've already shown you that one. But anyway, uh, you know, it's, we're saved by the, by the work of God. You can't take one shred of credit that you're a saved, born-again person. God did that for you. And uh, for, so by one spirit, that is, we believe that, and Baptist people have separated themselves from other groups because they believed in a regenerate membership. That means they, they believe that people who were going to join their church needed to confess personal faith in Christ. It's called regenerate, Baptist, uh, regenerate membership. And that separated them from all the other Protestant groups who were sprinkling babies and then hopefully sometime in their life they would wake up to their need for Christ and get saved. Well, we believe you need to wake up before you get in the church. You need to be born again. So let, let, I'm not forcing anything on this passage. 
If you're not saved, you don't even need to think about baptism. There's nothing advantage to any lost person for being baptized. Matter of fact, there's some disadvantages for lost people getting baptized because they put a confidence in it. They have a, they have a wonderful, warm feeling about it. They, they, they're curious and, my, this is wonderful. Well, it may take you to hell. It may take you to hell. For, for by one Spirit were we all baptized. For by one Spirit are we all baptized. I wonder, I wonder what they would have thought that meant. Well, it's, it's a word that baptizo is, is the Greek word. Uh, we transliterate it in our King James Bible and make a word out of there, the Greek uh, letters of that. And it means immersed. For by one Spirit are we all immersed. Now what would they have thought about? Well, they probably went back to chapter 1 when Paul said, You know, I thank God I never immersed any of you. I commissioned other people to do that. I didn't want you to be a follower of me. I wanted you to be a follower of Christ. I guarantee you these people did not think about some spiritual experience. They thought about a wet experience when they got in water. This is what the church would have thought about. Every member would have thought, remember every church was, had the same pattern. People that profess faith in Christ follow the Lord in baptism. And that baptism here is wet baptism. It's water baptism. Don't have to change anything about the passage. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now what, what is that? How about verse 27? You're the body. <laughs> yeah, I love it when the Bible says, speaks for itself. Doesn't need any interpretation. It just needs a lot of reading and reflection. And 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 in their own their own mind, they would have said, "Yeah, we, we are that. We're the body of Christ." You just told us that, Paul. We're the body of Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, or been made to drink of one Spirit, what does that mean? It meant that when you got into one of those local churches, there wasn't some kind of pecking order of superior Christians or inferior Christians, Jews or Gentiles. Ephesians says that middle wall of partition was broken down and anybody that gets saved and scripturally baptized is a part of the same group without being on probation. And that's what that means. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to correct anybody because I, there's no correction to be made. But what we need to realize is when, when people get in contact with us and then they get in contact with the gospel and then they get in contact with Christ and then they get in contact with the church, they all need to know there's only one race in the Bible and that's the human race. There's not a, a Gentile and, and Greek kind of world where we selectively say, you know, Jerusalem had a problem with that until God kind of whooped them out of it. And then finally they, they got excited about the Gentiles getting the gospel. Now I know we're all segregated in some ways by our jobs, by our families, by whatever else. But in, in, uh, in God's economy, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first. That's an order to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Your black brother or your black neighbor can get saved just like you got saved. And if we had it all right, they could surely be a member of this church as well. Because the nature of the church being the body of Christ is that all believers who are obedient to baptism are placed in the same membership in the same church. We don't have a you know, back room over here for those who kind of had a rough life and before they got saved or those of us who were 10 years old and got saved, you know, you get to another part of the church. No. These folks understood in plain language what he was talking about. The body of Christ is a local church. The baptism is water baptism. And you get in that by being obedient to baptism. That's how you join a church. This is basic Church membership 101, you get in a church by being obedient after salvation to the authority of a church. 
Why have we made this so blooming hard? Why, why have we made it so hard? Because a lot of smart people have decided that they're going to listen to the church fathers. I just gag when somebody quotes Augustine or somebody like that. That's a bunch of Catholic theologians. <coughs> Excuse me, I got that out of my... We just need to stick with the Bible, folks. And don't let somebody remove you from your faith about what you know you believe based on the fact of their education or they can quote more sources or whatever else. We need to know passages like 1 Corinthians 12 well enough that we can defend the faith based upon what the Bible says, not what somebody else says about the Bible. Amen. So let's go on now. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about you now. Because... The Bible, not only in this passage, talks about the body, which is the collection of those who are a part of that, but it talks about the members of the body of Christ. Any members of the body of Christ? Victor Baptist Church here tonight? Okay, let's talk together then. Let's talk about it a little bit. If you'll notice that in the 7,957 verses in the New Testament, there are only 19 verses in the New Testament that refer to believers who've been obedient to baptism being members of the body of Christ. Those three books right there, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, uh, tell us about those who are members. Now since you're one of those here, just kind of put a quarter in the parking, lot, parking space here and let's talk a little bit. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your responsibilities, your privileges. Now, isn't that a privilege to not only be in the family of God, but to be in the church of God, which is the body of Christ? It's a privilege. Amen. Nobody drug you in here and tied you up and force-fed you and made you stare in some kind of weird thing and now you sort of walk around in a daze. You willingly made this commitment of your life to Jesus Christ and the truth that you had heard, which was that there was a church that God had not only started during His own ministry, but it perpetuated for 2,000 years, and that if you were going to be obedient, you needed their baptism, and in their baptism, you would find the freedom to be a part of a body of Christ in your community. So what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it means that uh, there's some identity that goes on here. You are members of the body of Christ. It's pretty special. I think membership in a church is maybe one of the highest blessings you can get on this earth. To be a member of one of, the God, one of God's churches. It's really a, about who we are. That we, we have our identity in Christ and we have assembled together and we are bonded together in a body called the body of Christ because we think that he is worth all of our lives. It's who we are. It's an identity issue. It's also about unity. Can you imagine a body functioning without a sense of coordination? Now, I know some of us go through life. Later on, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still kind of on my feet and kind of agile and mobile and hostile and uh, whatever else. But, uh, you know, the older you get, the more you kind of are careful about how you're getting around and stuff. Well, in the case of a Christian, there should be some coordination, some unity. You ought to be doing some things, you ought to be doing some things, but we ought to be doing those things together. And there ought to be, there ought to be some real connectivity in our, in our church. Now, this size church, I, and, and I don't mean that in any kind of derogatory way at all, this, this, you can't hide out in this kind of church. I figured it out. Matter of fact, I know most of you by name. I've figured out who you are, who you're connected to, and there's a lot of family in this church. I'm telling you, y'all got married together and brought this thing in church. So uh, there is a sense of unity that's already here in the family that you have as a physical earthly family, but my, what a, what a deeper, more significant thing is you're part of God's family here in this church and there's a unity here and that's very special. 
But if you've ever noticed, by, by the way, just look left or right, there's quite a bit of diversity. There's no sense that a church should all be alike. Everybody should be the same in a church. Hey, listen, if there's only two people who are alike, like me, I'm voting for them to go. I'm staying. You know what I'm saying? Why, why do we have such diversity? Well, it's because God likes variety. My goodness, if, if everybody was like, don't say it out loud, okay? You know, it's a, man, if everybody's like him or her, well, that'd be terrible. No, not really. I mean, there's a little bit of seasoning that goes on with everything, but God put us in this, God put you in this church so that you could do His will in a different way. You could do the same thing in a different way. You, there's diversity. Now, that's, that's a real hip term today in the social world out here in America. They don't know what diversity is. Diversity in the world means weird. It just means you can be transgender or you can be whatever and, and you just be very, looked at as very, very normal. And I, I just don't get that. I, I've liked girls since I've been about 10 years old, I think. I never, I never figured out that that was really a thing that I wanted to kind of pursue in my life, a, you know, gender confusion or anything like that. I, I don't know how I got off on that. Y'all quit that, okay? <laughs> diversity. The world's view of diversity is you can be as weird as you want to be. In, in the work of the Lord is that you can be who you are in Christ and be useful in a church. I, I love these guys playing all these instruments. I, I don't think it's right. Your pastor can play the piano. I, I think that's wrong. Uh, I think it's just not right. My mom and dad wasted a little bit of money, not much, probably about six months at $3 a week trying to get me to learn how to, to, to play the piano. It was one of the worst investments they ever made in life. <laughs> I just never could get my fingers to connect with my brain and what I was seeing to the keyboard right underneath me here. But man, I love that. I love the diversity that I see about these guys playing these instruments and the singing. I like all that. I like it well. But wouldn't it be terrible if everybody sang the same note? Now, some of you don't know that there's any difference. I know that. <laughs> and you've been heard this week as well. Okay. <laughs> but the diversity is that Everybody knows their part and does it. Amen. And the harmony of that is, is what's so great. And I'll talk about that in the morning. You know, that all, being in the body also means we're dependent on each other. Amen. The idea that you could be a part of a church and not matter is not biblical. You matter. Amen. And, and you can't pull out of a church without hurting a church. Right. Right. I mean, people... I've heard every lame excuse for people leaving the church. Can you believe anybody would ever leave a church that I pastor? Come on now. Just think about it. Think about how odd that would be to walk away from somebody so clever, so wonderful, so beautiful as me and then that, and to think that they would have a good reason to do it. Hey, there have been many people leave our church that I've pastored, the churches I've pastored, and the last one for 33 years. You hang around that long. I, I could populate a small nation <laughs> of people who just thought that, well, I thought this was a good place, but it's not. And they can just up and leave and not a big deal. It just tears the heart of a pastor in a church for people to come in, pretend like it's a good place. And I'm not talking about people get moved to another city or another state and Providence takes them here or there. I'm talking about some little old petty something stupid that comes up and somebody get, somebody's, you know, doesn't like it or some, uh, boy, I'll tell you, you better get your life straightened out and stay in church. Don't no, stay in this church. If you're a member of this church, you ought to stay with this church because the Bible tells us that we're dependent on the other. Can you imagine trying to, trying to keep your face clean without your hands? It's like... It's, you, can't even, you can't even pretend how you're going to do that. I, I, we are made to be dependent on other parts of our body physically. We're made to be dependent on the others. So that's a part of being a member. And then, and then the harmony, and we've heard that harmony. We've heard that sense of connectedness 
here that goes on. The one that really exposes the fact that this is a local church deal and not a universal deal is really down in verse 26. He said this, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Do you know that can't happen outside of a local church? Not really. I mean, I read about stuff that goes on the other side of the world, and I go, oh, my goodness, that hurts me. <clears throat> okay, what's for supper? Amen. I'm shallow. Okay, I admit it. <laughs> you are too. You know what? You, you don't, yeah, you are too. Uh, yeah, right. You know what breaks my heart, though? When something happens to somebody in the church I'm a part of. Oh, my goodness. It rips my heart out. It it, it, I suffer with them. That doesn't happen in some kind of casual relationship where, yeah, you remember the body of Christ. All believers are from every tribe, tent, kindred, and tongue, from all the centuries of the world. Yeah, you remember the body of Christ. Really? No. We have, our deepest sympathies are in this fellowship of believers here. Amen. And this is only true in a local church. It's, it's a local church thing. And then when somebody's honored, it's like, hey, let's talk about it. Hey, got a raise, huh? <laughs> Good. Uh, be more tithing. Amen. Okay. Uh, we, we got this figured out. Praise God. A little honor. We all rejoice. We all share in the fact that, hey, little Isaac here, he's grown up and become the pastor. Little Isaac. Weird. That is weird, buddy. I'm telling you. <laughs> Isn't that great, though? Don't we all rejoice with that? Amen. I never thought about being the pastor where my dad pastored. I never thought about being the pastor of the church where I got saved and got baptized and got ordained to preach and got married in. I never thought about being able to be the pastor there. And they have been so gracious to me and my wife and my family. You know why? Man, we just suffer together and rejoice together. The highest elevation of accomplishment and the deepest sorrow. I think about the little babies that I've had to bury in my church. Those parents, it's a 10, 15, 20 year old event in the past. It's as fresh today as if it happened yesterday. My soul. Well, we need a church, don't we? Amen. We need a church. Man, the sympathy we feel with, for each other. And then, you know, it's, it's really about maturity. I love these little bitty kids. I love them. I love them that they're yours <laughs> and that you're going to take them home because I've done my deal. My wife and I have done our deal with raising a, a couple of children and, and the joy is we raise them not just for eternity. We raise them for maturity. You know, they got saved, but they also grow, grew up. And a lot of problems in Baptist churches would be immediately solved if people would just grow up. Amen. Now, all these little young people around here, I love them. And th boys, thank you for your name tags. If you switch them, I'm in trouble, okay? But, uh, you know, so our prayer should be your prayer that you'll have an influence on their life and they'll become mature Christians. See, see, most parents raise their children for the wrong reason. They raise them to get them out the door. Now, I, I rejoice in that. How many parents do not have children at home? Raise your hand. Boy, those are the ones. That, did you see that? Yes! 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 <laughs> They're the ones that have got a smile on their face, and they got money in the bank. Well, it took a lot to get those children matured, though. I think 
that there ought to be some genuine investment within the church for the maturity of children. We give money away to everything else and then we skimp on the thing that really matters is and that's young people. I'm talking about younger than teenagers by then. Wow. You know. But these younger children, they, we should be raising up young people. And we've done that so much. We, we've been a kingdom building church. We haven't been a large church, but we've sent a lot of people out who've done the work of the Lord and who've been doing the work of the Lord. Well, ought to be some maturity here. And uh, thank God. Now, I know, you don't, I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm a bodybuilder. That's really tacky of you laughing out loud. I, I can take a snicker here or there, but just this out... Uh, now, we enjoy this moment, but I'm going to turn the table on you. Does anybody think you're kind of putting on some spiritual muscle in your life? I mean, do, do, do people snicker at you when you say, yeah, I'm one of them Bible persons? No, you, you, need to, you need to intentionally move toward maturity. Intentionally. I love these little children, but I don't want them to be little children all their life. I want them to be mature. Let's get to the final point. Amen for the final point? Amen for the final point? Amen. All right, here we go. Since we got the body figured out, which is the local church, and we got the members figured out, that's the members, that's you, the believers who've been baptized and make up this body of Christ. Let's talk about what your ministry is. What's the ministry of the body of Christ? Well, number one, inwardly, you're to be edifying this body. If it can't build up the body of Christ here, what you're doing, your attitude, your words, your ideas, then you need to pray until it can. I was going to say something real rude and say, you know, you need to just quit. And I don't mean quit the church. I mean just quit being what you are. And, but we need to build up each other. I am by nature, I, 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 have, I am by nature gifted to be an encourager. Now, I know it did. You say, well, you failed this week. Well, that's okay. I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> but I really am. I'm one of those guys that say, I believe we can do it. Let's get out there. Let's get together. Let's, let's try to try our best. Let's, let's move forward. Let's get it done. You know why? Because there's enough naysayers out there beating us down. We need to come in this place and believe by the grace and help and power of God we can do something as a church. Amen. We need to edify that inwardly that we are built up in our faith and in our confidence in the God who is our head, Jesus Christ. That, that's one of our ministries. And then outwardly, we are to be a part of reaching our community. Now, now, we send money around, you know, across the sea, but what about across the street? What about people you know that you, you know you need to have a burden for them? God's ordained the means whereby people are going to be saved, and that is the sharing of the gospel. What we need to do as, as churches is we need to find ways that we can have an influence into people's lives. Individually, that may be the way we do it, but corporately, I think there are things that we can do to enhance our gospel opportunities with people. You can figure that out on your own. I don't need to write, write out what you need to do outwardly to reach other people. But if you don't know it, you're kind of on a clock right now. Because if you don't win somebody the Lord, death's going to take people out of here one by one. And eventually there won't be a church in Kingfisher unless you win people to Christ and get them in here to where they mature and become a part of the church. So it is your responsibility. Now, and some of that is uh, good preaching and pray for your preacher to, to uh, keep uh, preaching and being an earnest uh, uh, disciple of God's word. And, and some of that is a fellowship opportunity. Some people just stumble in here and they have no idea what we are. And they're, they're not hearing a thing. They're just going, what does that mean, stand up? Well, it kind of means stand up. 
You know, and, and so we're going to have to be patient with people that don't know this church deal. Amen. And don't be rude. I, I, I had guys that, were, that came off the street and they, they had a cap on and, and they were visitors and they didn't know that you don't wear caps inside the house. You know, that, it, it, it's not rude on their part for them to wear a cap. It's rude on our part to, to not get over that. I, I don't mean that we don't have any standards, that we don't care. But the world doesn't know what the rules are in here. So we need to be, we need to be reaching out to people that, that maybe don't look like us. Amen to that. That'd be good. And uh, because all the Spirit-filled, uh, dynamic people, they've already been saved. There's not, nothing but your sinners out there right now. All the sinners are just left out there. and We need to, we need to reach them. So, I think Kingfisher still got some sinners, don't they? I thought they did. I, I, I get on a plane quite a bit. and I remember years ago I got on a plane and a little stewardess said to me, well, how's business today, sir? And I said, man, business is great. And uh, she came, came back to me later and she said, what kind of business are you in? I said, I'm a preacher and there are plenty of sinners out there. <laughs> And she and I talked and had a great visit, but I remember how the fact that we think there's not anybody out there that wants what we got. Everybody out there needs what we have. Right, right. That's the gospel. And, and somebody, God used somebody in your life to bring you the gospel. We all pray that may be us. And then finally, upwardly, this body is all about the glorification of God. Unto Him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. I wonder, I wonder if most churches could survive without any personal recognition. You know, didn't have any, anybody's name in the bulletin, any thanks for, uh, you know, thank you card for any thoughtful thing done. It's like, well, I did that and nobody, nobody said I did a good job singing today. Well, your singing was okay, but your attitude evidently was bad. <laughs> You're not here to glorify yourself. Amen. Here to glorify God. Amen. Just glorify God. And uh, I really, we really ought to want Him to get all the glory and all the praise and all the credit. We'll take all the blame. We deserve all that. But my goodness, if we just start praising Jesus... Thanking Him for His goodness to us. Well, amen. Stand with me for prayer. Maybe there's a need in your life that you could just say, you know, I haven't, I haven't been the church member that I could be, and, and I, I just need to dedicate myself to that. And my family needs to be more church conscious about what we are. We, we're the body of Christ.